Hey, hey, welcome to Sketchy EBM. I'm Anthony Crocco, and today we're talking about Lost. Sadly, we're not talking about a mysterious South Pacific island with all our friends Hurley and Sawyer and Jack and all the rest. Today we're talking about Lost in the context of research. Specifically, we're going to talk about Lost to follow-up, and this is something that shows up in randomized controlled trials, especially trials about prognosis. Because I think it's important for us to really understand the impact of patients being lost to follow-up, I want to go through a simple example. Now this is obviously a fictitious study with a ridiculously low number of participants. The overall N of this study is 4, with 2 participants in the control group and 2 participants in the experimental group. In the control group, one of the 2 participants has the good outcome, and the other participant does not have the good outcome. Now I'm a bit of a math whiz and I calculate the probability of good outcome in the control group to be 50%. In the experimental group, one participant has the good outcome. Unfortunately, the second participant was not able to be reached by the researchers, and as such, they weren't able to know really what that person's outcome was. So the only results that the researchers have for the experimental group is the one participant who did well, and gives us a rate of 100% for this group, a number to me which seems not entirely appropriate. Let's imagine what might have happened to this participant and how that might affect the study's results. First off, the missing participant might have had the good outcome, which would have given the experimental group 2 out of 2 with a good outcome or 100%, making it better than the control group. Secondly, the participant may not have had the good outcome, and this would have left the experimental group with a 50% probability of good outcome, in which case it's no better than the control group and we'd have to weigh the other things involved with making a decision such as cost, compliance, and adverse effects. Lastly, on top of not having the good outcome, the participant may have had some horrible adverse effect. This would make the control intervention the better choice. I hope this illustrates to you why participants who go missing in a study really mess with our ability to make any conclusions about that study's results. So what's going to be the best way to find out if participants have gone missing? Well, if you're reading a research paper, it's really good to look for something called a consort diagram. Among other things, a consort diagram should show you the number of people who were approached for a study, those that were included and excluded, the number of people randomized to each arm, and what happened to them throughout the study, including were they lost to follow-up. If there are participants who have been lost to follow-up, it's a good idea to think about what the results would look like if the missing participants had a good outcome, not the good outcome, or worse, a bad outcome. You may be wondering whether there's an acceptable loss to follow-up level in any given study, and some people will quote less than 5% as being good and more than 20% as being bad. The problem here is that even a small percentage of participants in a study that go missing may have had a horrible outcome like death, and that would change dramatically what we do with our results. It turns out that no level of loss to follow-up is really reassuring, and each study has to be looked at specifically for this question. The overall effect of participants being lost to follow-up leads to something called attrition bias. Attrition bias occurs when you've got non-random loss to follow-up in one group or another. I've got a sketchy EBM video on bias if it's a concept you're struggling with. A couple other things that should make you skeptical if you're looking at loss to follow-up rates are first, if the loss to follow-up rate is bigger than the effect size, be wary. Secondly, if you notice that the loss to follow-up rate is much higher in one arm of the study compared to the other, you should also be very skeptical. So at the end of the day, what I want you to remember about the concept of loss to follow-up is that it's on us, the reader, to make sure that the researchers have accounted for all the participants in the study, and if there are some that have been lost to follow-up, we try and figure out what would be the implication if they had a good, neutral, or bad outcome. Like all other forms of bias, attrition bias is pretty nasty and can lead us astray. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Sketchy EBM. Please do take the time to evaluate, and as always, draw your own conclusions. <laughs> <laughs>